En uh, goedemiddag, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome everyone to the special program on uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, big data, and human rights. Uh, my microphone, is it working? Directly, yeah? Is it? Yes, the green one. Okay, hi. Uh, please don't forget to put your phone on silent mode. And the hashtag for today is HR Weekend, Human Rights Weekend. My name is Baram Sadegi, and I have the great honor and maybe greater responsibility to be your moderator, to be your host today. And as you probably can hear, English is not my first language. I know it comes as a shock, but believe it or not, I'm not a native speaker of English language. As a matter of fact, as someone who has uh, lived first 18 years in Iran and now 33 years in Holland, I have no idea what my first or second or third language is. But I guess you can understand what I'm saying, I hope, inshallah, yeah? Okay, okay, that's a good sign, okay. And I don't have to tell you about the importance of uh, artificial intelligence in our daily live as a friend of mine uh, he told me he said uh, probably big data big data uh, she knew that some of you will attend this event even before you knew that so that's how it works probably and uh, so enough about me enough about uh, the uh, importance of big data please allow me to tell you something about the course of the program we will have three speeches three lectures, and after that we'll have a panel discussion about uh, max 20 uh, minutes, and after that uh, there is room for Q&A uh, for about 20 minutes. And uh, uh, especially I hope that you can ask your question during the Q&A, but even if during the panel discussion, if I miss an important issue, please raise your hand, I will come to you, of my colleague will come to you with a microphone, please stand up and ask your question. Uh, in the microphone, because without microphone, nobody can hear us right now uh, with uh, streaming. So that's very important to use the microphone. And we will start with the upside part of the big data. And later, we will go to the downside of the big data. For the upside of big data, we have asked uh, Benjamin Strick, he, uh, who is with uh, Bellingcat. Benjamin, would you please join me here? Benjamin? And this one is for you. Um, Benjamin, I'm so glad that you are here and you, you, uh, you made a whole presentation for us. But before we start, you know, just for two people who don't know Bellingcat, what is Bellingcat? What do you do? Uh, so what is Bellingcat? That's a really good question. It's something I get off, asked often quite, quite a fair bit. So uh, Bellingcat is just a community of people online. Um, it's people that I work with every single day. Uh, most of them I've never met. But I speak to them every single day. I consider some of them my best friends. Uh, essentially, it's a pack of nerds on Twitter that overanalyze uh, anally and autistically to a very deep level uh, videos, news content, and sometimes we help. Okay, and you know, uh, I've been to some uh, sessions, some some uh, public uh, discussions, when, where Bellingcat was one of the subjects, you know, and there is always, you know, this old-fashioned, maybe it's a Dutch issue, about the financing of Bellingcat. You know, who is paying you? you know, who, who, how, how does it work? Who is paying the, it's all these uh, volunteers uh, who are doing a great job for Bellingcat? <laughs> Except um, uh, the uh, Mossad and CIA and, and George Soros. So who is paying you? <laughs> yeah. I, I, knew, I knew you were going to bring up the CIA thing. Um, no, so I'm a Bellingcat contributor. So most of the work I do is for free. So I do it on the weekends or Friday nights or Saturday nights when most people, when most normal people go out. I sit in my boxer shorts and I look at Google Earth and YouTube videos and try and find where they are and find jihadist training camps. Um, but uh, I, I think uh, the payment structure of Bellingcat primarily relies on teaching people. And it's something that the open source community as a whole really appreciates. Because whenever we do something, whenever we find out our working, we don't just publish a, a small report. We publish how we got there. And it teaches people how to do that. And that's what most of us are really passionate about, right? So we go around to newsrooms, to universities, to uh, NGOs, and we teach them how to, well, use Facebook and uh, Twitter and YouTube 
and go a little bit further than liking things and just watching videos of cats online. So, yeah. <laughs> Berlin cat, I get it, yes. So, Benjamin, you will start your presentation. Unfortunately, you know, we uh, like tested everything during this, this morning, but some of the sounds of the clips, they are not uh, working. So, but you were uh, uh, able and, and willing to do the sounds live here of the shootings and stuff like that. But with that note, you know, and you said that your presentation will be about 25 minutes max. I will sit here and will give you five minutes time when it's uh, almost five minutes, yes? Great, thank okay. you. Okay, great. Cool, so, goedemiddag uh, allemaal. Ik ben Ben. No. I'm going to do this in Australian, so I'm not going to do it in English. I also don't speak English, so if you can't understand my accent, please uh, excuse me, I'm from the other side of the world. But if you flip the world over, I'm from the top. So, cool. Um, so, yeah, my name's Ben. Uh, I'm from... <laughs> I thought you'd like that one. So you can look at satellite imagery and turn it over, it's there. Um, so my name is Ben, uh, I'm a Bellingcat contributor, as most of you have heard, and uh, I am an open source investigator with the BBC. <laughs> so most of my role is not looking at cats online, which I'd like to, or as we were speaking about before, cats on Roombas driving around, so that's artificial intelligence and cool things. Um, but rather, most of my work is looking at very, very horrific videos. So. Not, not the sort of nice stuff that you'd like to see when you wake up on a Saturday morning or a Wednesday morning and start looking at and analysing and watching 300 times. So I'm going to go a little bit into uh, my slides here. Cool, so the slides work, so we can rely on technology today. Um, yeah, so my name is Ben Street. You can follow me on Twitter if you want, Ben Do Brown. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what my presentation is about. Uh, I'm going to talk for 15 to 20 minutes and I'm going to show you some pretty cool stuff. Specifically, I'm going to show you how we debunk government fake news by Twitter DM. Does anyone here on Twitter, does anyone use Twitter at all? Yeah, cool. Did anyone use Google Maps, by the way, to get here? Like, did you have a look at the direction? Yeah, cool, I did, I've never been here before. So this is the only way I got here. It's also how I found this human rights crime. So we're gonna go through this and show you some cool things. But first of all, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what open source information actually is. It's the stuff that we look at every single day. So it's things like these news agencies, the New York Times, BBC, CNN, if you watch that sort of stuff. But then it's also these things, and this is, everyone looks at Facebook, right, for their news feed. They call it news feed, but it's actually pictures of coffees and untouched bowls of cereal, yeah? But there's some more important things on there. You've got Snapchat, you've got Twitter, and the entire community across the world uses these things. But then we've also got other things like small niche things, like uh, dating apps. Strava, so if you're into fitness and you like running, you can track your location and tell your friends how far you ran. Cool, hey? Again, contributing to big data and letting people track you. But then we've also got satellite imagery, which is essentially a selfie of the Earth, of every square metre of the Earth. So when we want to find something, we can look at it on satellite imagery and say, well, yeah, it's a photo of, of, of the world. It's, it's, it's a photo of that location. I can verify the location. It's not fake news, right? This is what we're going to go through. And then we obviously have these things. And these are, these are ways that we can search our way through this big information. Google, Yandex, which is a really good image reverse search engine if you've ever used it. Much better than Google. Anyway, what I'm going to do is uh, talk to you about a video that came out on one of these social platforms on July 10, 2018. It's a bit of a horrific video, but as we described before, uh, we don't have audio on this one today, it's not working. So I'm going to narrate the sounds a little bit for you and just tell you what's going on. Uh, I've edited this video to make sure that it's not too horrific to show you guys today, but I'd really like you to turn your analyst brains on and pretend you're all spies and think about what's happening in this video, because we're going to debunk this video right now. Cool, so what you're seeing is something in what looks like Africa. It's in a dusty Sahel track. We have people that look like soldiers walking down a whole body road. The sounds you'll be hearing right now are these people saying, you are Bihach, which is Boko Haram. Uh, they're speaking a northern accent of French, so Francophone region of Africa. They're slapping the women. You can see one is carrying a baby on her back. It's obviously very young. The other one has a little girl who obviously is startled, doesn't know what's going on, and she's just walking down the path blindly, being led by a mother. You can see the control factor here. These soldiers are in charge. 
and the women have no hope whatsoever of doing anything. This screen is black because the audio of the screen is gunshots. They were killed. They were blindfolded. They were knelt down against the rocks and they were killed. When the little girl was moving again, they shot her again. They made sure that there was no one left alive. So all four, the two little girls or the two little children and the two women were killed. When I first saw this, I was horrified, as most of you would be. This is no laughing matter. Two, four people just got killed. Innocent people, right? I was absolutely horrified. And there were actually quite a few other of my friends, as I explained before about Bellingcat, we're a community. We were all horrified. But we thought to ourselves, hey, we can do something about this. Maybe we can find out who is responsible for this, where this happened, for instance. So we started looking online. But funnily enough, a day after, the Cameroonian government issued a press statement saying that this is fake news. Now, why did they say this is fake news? This is quite interesting because there was a lot of social media going on about this. This was a, this was a viral video. Obviously, it was spread because it's, it's, it's four innocent people that have been killed. And this is horrendous. People want to find out what happened. So the Cameroonian government said, no, this is fake news. The extrajudicial ex ex executions did not happen in Cameroon. They said it on four reasons. And this is the letter that described the reasons. I want to point this out to you. Specifically, they said it's an instance of gross misinformation and that the facts have nothing to do with the work of the Cameroonian military, basically. They said four points. The first point was it doesn't look like the, like the layer or the land of Cameroon. The second point was the weapons that were used were not used by the Cameroon military. The third point, the uniforms weren't from the Cameroon military. And the fourth point, and the best one, that the members involved, the, the men involved, were not members of the Cameroon military. Let's misprove them right now. Let's first of all go through the standard journalism questions or just the curiosity questions that everyone has. The who, the what, the where, and the when. Let's start with the where. It's called verification. And this is what we go through with the Bellingcat community. This is what we do with the BBC, the New York Times. It's an important way to debunk fake news. It's called verification. And the first stage of verification is a thing called geolocation. It's finding where this was. So as you saw in the video before, you saw some still scenes and it looked like the filmer was panning his camera around, yeah? So we can take screenshots of this videos and using our spy train minds, not really, it's just from YouTube, we can train ourselves to start looking at, f at things in the background that we can find maybe might be on satellite imagery. There might be a big building that you recognise. It might be the, the central station in Amsterdam, right? So in this one, it's not the central station, obviously. It's a dusty Sahelian bowl. But up on the, in the middle here, just towards the right, there's a really unique feature. It's a mountain range, and it has a signature feature of these three unique humps. And funnily enough, Google Earth lets us view mountains. And we can have a look at this signature right here and think to ourselves, well, how many mountains in, in, in Africa, for instance, would have this? Okay, probably a lot. So we spent three weeks, three entire weeks, looking around on Google Earth. What you can do is, can I get this one played, mate? Cheers. So what we can do is we can zoom in, and everyone has access to this. We use it to find a bully. We use it to find the nearest pub or the best cafe or where to have breakfast on a Sunday morning. We can also use this to tilt the earth and have a look at the 3D points measured by mountains. Well, isn't that a great fit? This is our signature of a mountain range right here. So we just found the location where that video was. Sorry, I'm in your road. So we just found the location of where that video was filmed, yeah? But I can't just say that because these are mountains here, that that's completely verified. No, we have to match this up a little bit further. So there we have the mountains. Great. Good fit. But we need to verify that location specifically. So we can use satellite imagery to start mapping out things that we might have seen on the ground, like these buildings, this path, and this path that you saw down here. But also these things on the, on the right side of the track or, or the opposite side where the people were actually killed. These are terrace lines and they're actually quite common in the north of Cameroon where the minister said this didn't happen. Okay, cool, but let's go a little bit step further than that. We've got these ones here. On satellite imagery, it's a perfect match. On a quiet Saturday evening while my friends were out drinking, I matched up every single tree 
to satellite imagery. It's a complete DNA verification match of what appears on satellite imagery that you use to find the nearest cafe. Great, let's go a step further because we can also answer another thing called the when. How do we do that? Well, we've got geolocation for the where, chronolocation gives us the when. And this is something we've invented over time through Bellingcat and through the open source community. If these cool little phrases that we have like geolocation and verification make our work sound cool, but really it's just nerdy analysis. So let's have a look at the when. So with satellite imagery on Google Earth, we can scroll back in time. And I highly recommend you do it for Groningen or for Amsterdam because you can see the development of buildings over time. You can also see when buildings were there and when they weren't. You can see different seasons in Africa too. So you can see the dates down the bottom. From home in my boxer shorts, I was able to slide on Google Earth from 2016 to 2014, right? There's some buildings missing in each of these. So we can match that up with a video and say, okay, well this guy up here, this building, it was only there around 2015. This building here was only there in the middle period. The ones in green are present, the ones in red are not. As you can see down here, we're starting to narrow down our track. Eventually, we come across this path in red as well, so we can narrow our time down to about 2015, 2016 in January or March. Okay, cool, but let's go a step further than that. Let's do something really, really cool. So a long, for a long time in history, people have been using things called sundials, right? Has everyone heard of a sundial? Does everyone know how it works? Put your hands up if you know. Awesome, common sense, right? It's all about angles and sunlight. Let's turn this guy into a sundial. So all we need to do, since we've got the exact location, we can start to work out, okay, well, if we take a screen measurement, I'm talking a ruler on the screen, on your computer screen, we take the height of the soldier, which was I think about 14 centimetres, <laughs> and then we take the length of his shadow. It doesn't matter about the lengths, it matters about the angle between these. So now that we have the angle of where the sun was coming from, we can go a step further and have a look at the angle of the direction of the sun on a satellite image. Cool, with those two variables, we can now use a free tool, because I'm doing this from home, remember, in a Groninger little student gamma, so it's, uh, it's uh, on the cheap for me. So we can do this in, all uh, oh, the lights are playing up, cool. So we can do this on a free little tool called SunCalc. You can use this as well. We put in those two variables and we start to get a measurement of time. This video that you just saw happened between March 20 and April 5, 2015. Cool, that's a pretty narrow window. It's definitely not a guess. Now that we have the where and the when, we can start to go through some more further analysis. This starts to identify who is responsible for killing these women and children. First of all, let's take a look at the weapon. There was actually one weapon in here and it wasn't just one of the AK-47s that you usually see around the African Sahel in, in, in uh, human rights abuses and things like that that we usually look at. This one was quite unique in its feature. It looked very European made, especially with the, the, the butt of the weapon. It's quite unique. It, was, it looked like a, pretty, you know, a new sort of good, a uh, good functioning weapon, right? Not, not a hand-me-down AK-47 like most of these people are using. We can also uh, pause uh, the, 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 the part of the video where we see the butt of the weapon after he's shot the children. So we can start to see the foregrip, the front muzzle, the receiver, all of these things could match up. Okay, great. The weapon is, is a star of the M21. Want to know how I found that out? I put into Google, Cameroon military, weapons. I got this picture. On the left, you see the US military. So that's cool, that's cool. That verifies an image for us because the US are in it. So I see the US military on the left. On the right, that's Cameroon military, but not just the military, it's a specific unit that's called the BIR. It's a rapid intervention squad. And these guys have been known to be going through houses, pulling out people and burning villages in Cameroon. Great, we're starting to get some ground process here. So these are the weapons that they are issued with and they're practicing their drills with the US military right here. There we are, matches up perfectly. Now the minister said that he has no knowledge of this weapon being used in Cameroon military or in that region. These videos from YouTube, these photos from Facebook and pictures on Instagram tagged to that area are of Cameroon soldiers using that weapon. Great, got you there minister. So, what else can we use to support our argument to debunk his claim of fake news? What about the uniforms? 
He said in his statement that the uniforms were not used in that area. Okay, great. Well, we can turn back to social media and we can find this photo on Facebook. It's got the soldiers tagged in that area from Cameroon military wearing the exact same French lizard uniform. Now, speaking of big data, we also have free applications such as uh, websites that document all of the camouflage uniforms in the world. It's called Camouflage Uniform Database. Easy, right? You can type it into Google. So you can click on a country and see every single uniform that's used, but also the specific unit. Great. So we've got those guys. But furthermore, we can head over to social media and we can have a look on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube as to where these guys are and what they're wearing. Great. They're not wearing fancy polo outfits. They're wearing the exact same French lizard uniform that was in that building that the minister said was not being used in this area. Funnily enough, the guy in the top right that's doing push-ups, he was doing them at a base that was 800 metres away from where these women and children were killed. That's a nice one for the minister to take note of next time to do some research on social media. Here is a, it's a little bit dark with the contrast, but you can see this image right here. You can see the weapons and the uniforms being used by these guys, and it's in that exact area. I blurred out the names because these men are innocent until proven guilty. But, so, furthermore, now speaking about AI, one of the tools we have freely available to us is artificial intelligence. You don't have to be a spy to have access to this. It's called YouTube. If you watch lots of soccer videos, so if you're a fan of the Ajax here, and is anyone a fan of the Ajax football team? Yep, cool. One person. Great. All right. <laughs> okay, not there. Who likes watching videos of cats on YouTube? Yeah? Awesome. So do I. The next day you log into YouTube, you notice that the recommendations on your YouTube feed is full of videos of cats. Do you know why? That's called an artificial intelligence bot. It starts learning from your search results. So if you spend three weeks searching for the Cameroon military on YouTube in that area, Thanks, AI. You just helped me out, mate. So robots are helping us do these human rights crimes for free. So the military outpost, I was searching this stuff a lot online. And at some point, about three weeks after I trained my little YouTube bot, it gave me this result. It was a news footage package, or news package of footage from this area. How did I know it was this area? Well, this guy's thankfully enough, pointing to the mountains, giving me a sign. Oh, let's find these mountains. Cool, here they are on Google Earth. But funnily enough, he's standing at the front of a base that they show right behind him. So it's a little military base and we can geolocate this just by these things here. So we've got the sandbags, we've got the tree, and we've got this little tin roof that will show up really well on Google Maps. Great, here we are. Perfect match. That was 800 metres away from the base. Uh, from, from that, that base is 800 metres away from where the people, the, the, the four innocent people were killed. Now, funnily enough, the minister actually did say that these cannot be Cameroon military members because they're not dressed to appropriate standards. He said specifically they look like they might have come from a, from a patrol base, but there's none in the area. He obviously doesn't know where his patrol bases are. There's one 800 metres away. Great. So, we've got a nearby base that this guy obviously doesn't know about whatsoever. What else can we do? Now that we've got all this information of where, of when, a possible military base, we can start to identify the soldiers that are there. From my little student karma in, in uh, Groningen and speaking with some people via Twitter DM online who I've never met in my life, we mapped out the Cameroon military. And we started to identify members that would have been there at that time uh, by rank, by platoon movements, by comments from partners on social media, we mapped out most of the Cameroon military that you would find. Funnily enough, in the video, they mention a guy called Chocho. This is Syriac Bityala. His friends call him Chocho on social media. But also, okay, so we can't just put that guy out there. He might be wrong. But this is his friend, Banamas Donosu. He uh, is friends with him on social media. He was also present in the video. You don't believe me? The Cameroon military, after finding this out and finding out that we we're on their tail, put out an arrest warrant for these men. They're arresting, they said that they're arresting seven people, including these two men, right here. Banabas Donosu and Syriac Bityala. But also, thanks to, our, thanks to my YouTube algorithm bot, I found a video of a platoon commander that was there at the time at that base. He is also mentioned on this, Etienne Fabusu, the platoon commander. 
So with all these things in mind, the Cameroon government said that they will investigate this human rights crime. They will investigate the video. This was still last year. There have been no reports of the investigation whatsoever. The comment on the sheet, on the, on the communique from the Cameroon government was that they will receive a fair trial. I'm going to end on that point to let you think about that video and think about how those women were led down that dusty Sahel bowl. Did they receive a fair trial and will the Cameroon government do an investigation like we did? I'm Benjamin Strick and thank you very much for your time today. Cheers. <laughs>that's very nice uh, to come over here to Amsterdam. Um, well, I'm going to tell you something about um, the law, the legal perspective on AI. Um, let's uh, see, you know, the robots are coming our way and uh, for lawyers it's also a very uh, threatening uh, thing that's coming up because if, uh, if there is so many uh, going on on AI, are we still necessary in, let's say, 10 or 20 years. So it's very important for us to learn more on AI. Um, um, so yeah, I work at ELO and at Ho Hoogheemstra and Partners. And last year I, I um, um, defended my thesis. And my thesis is on automated decisions by the government. We uh, in the Netherlands receive many automated decisions, but in other countries as well. You know uh, fines for speeding, for instance, they are made totally uh, without any human interference. Uh, but also the benefits are um, decided by uh, computers. In Australia, there was this very famous RoboDebt case. Have you heard of the RoboDebt? Yeah? Well, that's what the, the Dutch example uh, is. But it's not as gross as, uh, as in Australia, but I uh, did some research on it and I tried to figure out how we can look from a legal perspective to this new kind of execution. Uh, law and AI may seem very opposite to each other. They, they are opposite. You know, if you look from an AI kind of way, you, have, you are calculating all the time. And legal uh, reasoning is a very different way of reasoning. So we have to bring those types of people, or brains, uh, words, language is very important. The language of, um, in, in, in other sciences is very different than the post sometimes to our language. So we have to learn more about each other. Yeah, lawyers are especially, uh, are, are also uh, uh, different people because we are very focused on everything that can go wrong. If I look at this, it would never come into my mind that I think it was a very good idea to put this carpet here, you know, with this, yeah, it's fit a bit, but it's very dangerous. You know, what would happen if I fall here? Uh, the amount of um, money that the Bali should pay me if, if I, uh, you know, end up very injured here. As a lawyer, I would definitely say, uh, get out of the carpet, get rid of the carpet. Um, well, that's what we do, right? We are focusing on things that go wrong. If you are um, living together and you want to make a contract and you go to notary, he will tell you, oh, but what if things go wrong? Who is, uh, hold who is getting the cat afterwards? And for who is the Roomba? You know, it's not a very nice conversation. It's not romantic, but that's what we do. Uh, however, in data science, people look a bit differently, and, and that's why I like this quote so much. It's on uh, Alan Partridge, and he said, people forget that 95% of the Titanic's maiden voyage was uneventful, very pleasurable sailing. 
So that's the other side. I call it the AI side of looking at people. They are calling or IT, IT people. You see, very often they like to talk about the happy flow chart. They build everything into the happy flow, like. People are not going to die, are not moving, uh, don't um, get a divorce. That's how they build their system. So um, that's a bit uh, kind of a gap you need to bridge. It's calculating the averages. So you look at the main uh, uh, numbers and we, are look at, we look normally at the anomalies. Um, the question of my um, uh, talk today uh, was, how is the development in the field of law and can it keep up with emerging technology? Uh, and for me, I like to um, uh, put something, to add something. Can we keep up with the use of emerging technology? Because it's not always a question of the technology itself, but it's also the question of the people who decide we are going to use it. Uh, and I love law. That's very important, but um, <laughs> I want to state that. I really do. Uh, but that's not the case for many lawyers. They don't really like or love AI. So it's, it's a different uh, approach. Um, and that's why we need to talk on people who have done research for long times and also lawyers need to understand much better um, why we have to look at the use and of the technology itself. And then I always come up with Langdon Winner and Kranzberg. Kranzberg made six laws and he wasn't a lawyer. Uh, he made the law that uh, technology is not neutral. Uh, it's not good or bad, but it's not neutral. And it's very important to understand that there are some things that you get for free if you are using technology. Um, and the other part that we need to understand if, is that do politics have artifacts? That was what Langdon Winder discovered. He discovered that there was uh, built a bridge by Moses and the, those bridges were too low to, for public transport, meaning that people with low income and the black uh, people in America couldn't reach uh, and go on uh, in the weekend to some islands. So he discovered that uh, perhaps it looks neutral, an architect is responsible for building a nice safe bridge, but he had also some ideas that made the bridge like that. And we see examples of it every, uh, everywhere around us. Uh, like the ATMs, they, can, they are made for people like me. So if I'm in a wheelchair, I'm uh, excluded because I can't um, get to the ATM because it's too high. So it's, it's everywhere around us that technology sometimes have hidden uh, impact. Um, another example uh, are the great boulevards in Paris. We like them a lot, especially if you uh, have to go around here in Amsterdam with the small streets. But the boulevards, they were built to um, uh, knock down all kinds of new revolutions in the city. So it was made very wide, so there could five gendarmes on horse enter the city like that. So it was built with that intention. Um, what I tried to do in my research uh, was um, to look at old principles, because that's the beauty of the law, we have old principles. They are sometimes a bit vague, but, but you know, they have survived for so many years, perhaps that's why it's very useful to look at them. And I try to, uh, um, uh, to, to confront them with new technology, though I have to say that we are talking now on AI. Um, like it's a very new thing, but in the 70s and 80s, uh, it was the first AI um, uh, booming uh, business and a lot of governmental systems have AI in it, but it's AI built in the 70s and 80s and we don't call it AI now, but it was back then. Um, well, from a legal perspective, I could say yes, they are very well applied on new technology. So if I look at a principle like um, non-discrimination and I know a bit about AI, then I can already tell that there are probably some things getting wrong. Uh, we all know the example that if you look at the, at the history of American presidents, no AI system would have uh, predicted that Obama would be the new president because he was not in the training set. People like him were not in the training set. 
So um, then I could say, yes, I could, I, I, this principle is still very worth, worthy to examine. But if I looked, and that I did, on the daily practice, I saw no consideration on legal perspectives whatsoever, really no. So I asked them things like, are you aware of the fact that the citizens can have a complaint? I can, are they entitled on complaints? Yes, they can have, file a complaint. And then what you do when the, when the complaint is right and you have to reset some data in the database, they, uh, the program people, had no answer because they were not trained to look at those um, things. So I saw that the legal perspective was totally away um, once people are going um, build systems. Well, what's the relevance of law in a data-driven government? If you, you all know Carol Beer, right? She is the one that sits through the computer. Uh, she can be the civil servant you meet on every uh, weekday. And the person that says, no, I can't help you because the system or the computer says no. And so um, in that case, if we, we call those people the, the street level bureaucrats, in this case, it will be a matter of, uh, of time if, if the law actually plays a part. But we don't know. Um, and I noticed that people who were the street level uh, bureaucrats really wanted to help a lot. So that was uh, in government very reassuring observation. But it's not that good, it's not that well at the bosses. And bosses, they tend to lay the focus on the quads. Um, if you have seen the movie Mon Monster, have you seen it? It's uh, on the, the financial crisis and then George Clooney advises people to buy a product and some of them do and then it all goes wrong, they lose their money and the only uh, way that they say that was, um, well, that can explain this, they said it was a glitch. There was a glitch in the algorithm. Ah, and all the other people say, yeah, 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 that's very disturbing, a glitch. Yeah, that can happen, right? It's, it's algorithm glitch. It all sounds very uncomprehensible, so we have to say yes, yes, yes. And no one ever accepts the fact that they don't understand things. Um, so we, we can blame it on the quants, but most of the time it are the bosses that determine to use the algorithms or to say, I've, I've seen program people that tell me, yes, I've made this program for 80% of the cases. It was never my intention to make it um, decide in 100% of the cases. So that's, the, again, the use of technology is a human decision. Um, nowadays, I hear so many things on ethics. Ethics is the new uh, wonder. Um, um, you get money if you say you do some research on ethics and uh, companies are even telling us they are having an ethical board. Everyone is talking about ethics. But I don't like it because we have to look at regulation and uh, yeah, rules, just legal hard rules. Um, but that would need that the lawyers need to learn more about AI. Because, you know, I, I've, I've told you we have the law, which is very uh, nice, um, lovable, but we have to apply it on AI. So then lawyers need to understand more on AI. That's why I'm so very happy that in the Netherlands we have a national AI course. You all can learn more on AI. It's free. It's online, takes you, takes you um, for instance, like five hours, so it's very thoroughly, and you can learn and have a certificate. And it's based on the example of Finland, 1% of all the Finnish have followed already this course. Um, so we are slowly shifting from the rule of man to rule of law to rule of code, so we have to protect ourselves. And I think there are a few, case, a few things that we can uh, use to get things better. Uh, we need lawsuits. We really need lawsuits. It demands the lawyers and judges to look better into AI and, and its consequences. Because the law is already there, the regulations is already there. We really need cooperation between supervisory authorities. You can't say this is a matter of the Data Protection Authority or the Committee for Fundamental Rights. You have to get those together, even um, the, um, the, the institute that is um, uh, like calculating all the expenses of the government. Also, those institutes have to work together. Um, we need to challenge the system in the design phase. 
on data protection, it's already very common. We have data protection impact assessments. Uh, a colleague of mine has made an AI impact assessment, so we can use it in the beginning of building. Um, looking at um, the EU, of course, we have to work together. Um, or a Council of Europe, of course, follow Finland. Because in Finland, as I told you, they built uh, from the university, not government. The university made the first national course. Now government has adopted the idea and they're saying we want to lead the world, not in expenses on AI, because they say we can never win from China or America, but we can lead the world in building responsible AI. So I want to uh, I want very much that the Netherlands would follow that advice. And the most important thing is that we really need to look at AI and the use of AI for multidisciplinary um, um, fields so that we can work together. We need to understand each other. We need to learn some common language. And I am uh, sure that then everything will be much better than if we just let the AI rule us. We have to rule AI. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Melis. Our uh, final uh, speaker is um, Evelyn Austin. She's with uh, Bits of Freedom. Bits of Freedom is an organization um, working on privacy and freedom of communication uh, online. Uh, Evelyn, would you please um, join me here? Okay. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for inviting us to speak. Um, Bits of Freedom is a digital rights organization based in the Netherlands. Um, we are about um, uh, 10 people at the moment. Um, we work at a national and at an EU level. And at the moment, we um, uh, our main focus is um, uh, privacy and communication uh, in the digital world. Um, you can imagine perhaps that over the past 10 years, um, our work has expanded exponentially. Um, the internet has become part of almost every aspect of our life. Um, so when we were invited to come and speak here, um, I asked myself the question, if you can talk about anything, what do you talk about? Um, and the um, lucky you um, uh, subject that I chose is something that we're working on right at this moment and um, where decisions are being made on uh, as we speak. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about um, uh, the general monitoring of our communications by big platforms. So um, what you see is that um, governments, and um, I'm going to talk about two regulatory uh, proposals from the EU institutions. Uh, the EU institutions are forcing governments to um, uh, uh, monitor everything that we upload to uh, to the internet. So that's done by automated content filtering. Um, YouTube and um, uh, Facebook already do this. Um, um, the big change is going to be that instead of um, uh, filtering and performing content moderation on stuff that you put online, um, these filters are going to act um, one step earlier. So that means that the moment you try to upload something, an automated decision will be made about if you're allowed to do that or not. Um, the two regulatory proposals that this is being proposed in um, is a proposal for new copyright law and a proposal for the prevention of the dissemination of possible terrorist content online. So it is not uh, legal to um, uh, uh, write general, to general monitoring obligations into the law. So what the lawmakers are doing is they are creating a huge liability for platforms that give platforms no other choice than to um, uh, implement upload filters, automated upload filters. So what are the consequences of this going to be? One reason why I wanted to talk about this today is because we also already see some of the consequences of this. And I think it's um, when we talk about AI, often we sort of have these doom scenarios about being replaced by robots. Um, and I think this is a really good example um, because it, it makes it a, a bit more concrete. So the first consequence of having our communications monitored by automated um, systems 
um, is that Google and Facebook uh, will decide the limits uh, of our freedom ex of expression. So I want to give two examples. Um, the first one is, um, uh, it is going to include a kind of a horrific image. Um, so uh, be prepared for that, I guess. Um, that's this one. So this was a story that the New York Times um, uh, ran about the war in Yemen. Um, it sh showed a number of uh, quite horrific pictures of, I don't know if people need to see it better, <laughs> but thank you. Um, um, it showed a number of, of really horrific pi pictures of um, uh, starving children. Um, there is a journalist uh, called Shady Grove Oliver, which I'm sure is not her real name. Uh, that might be rude. It might be her real name. Um, she uh, operates in um, uh, uh, Alaska, and some of the places where she um, uh, where she uh, visits and the people that she uh, sort of services with her journalism, Facebook is the main communication platform. There's there's not much else. So she shared um, this uh, uh, article by the New York Times. Um, with her followers on her Facebook account, and very soon thereafter, Facebook um, deleted it. So they took it down because it was in breach of their community guidelines. Um, does anyone have an idea of which of their community guidelines it might have been in breach of? Yes, it was nudity or sexual activity. Um, of course, uh, the journalist in question um, um, uh, opposed uh, the takedown and said, um, uh, explained to the bot or whatever you, it is you're talking to when you fill out their form um, that uh, this was an article about a war, um, that these children were starving, that it was important for these pictures, even though they might be very gruesome, to get out. Uh, the bot just continued to say no. Um, the journalist then linked um, to an article that the New York Times posted right after this one in which they explained their editorial decision to publish these pictures. Um, that also didn't help. Um, when there was, there started to be some public pressure, um, uh, and, and after the public pressure, Facebook did reinstate the pictures or the post. Um, that seemed uh, fine. Um, there was no transparency over what had gone wrong, why they had taken it down, why they put it back up. Um, and um, not surprisingly, uh, right after it was reinstated, it was taken back down again, um, and her account was blocked. So the other um, the other example I would like to show is a Dutch example. Um, early 2018, sort of between January and May, um, the YouTube of accounts of Women on Waves, a Dutch pro rights advocacy group, um, uh, were taken down three times. So three times in three months. So Women on Waves um, offers reliable medical information about terminating a pregnancy. Um, as you can see, they do that in multiple languages. Um, the first time that their account was blocked, um, a well-known journalist took to Twitter and started complaining about it. Um, and after that, YouTube reinstated the videos. Um, does anyone remember when the referendum in Ireland was about the Abortion law? Was it April 1st or March? Anyway, about a month before that was happening, um, their account was taken down again. Um, it, it, they had the feeling it might be related, uh, but we don't really know. Um, and they again objected and went through YouTube's uh, redress procedure, um, but that had no effect. Um, again, a journalist takes to Twitter, calls YouTube out on it, and YouTube reinstates their account. Um, it happens a third time, a month later. Um, now um, it was uh, not just videos, but also their entire account, so the Women on Waves account, and I think their other account is called Abortion Pill. Um, they're taking, taken down again. Um, at that moment, um, we're in touch with them, and we reach out to um, Google in the Netherlands, um, and they uh, reinstate the account and send us an email back and say, it's been reinstated, so problem solved. 
Um, we don't think that really solves the problem, and I don't think it solves the problem for women on waves. Um, um, that threw me off. Um, because what we see is that their automated content filtering doesn't work. Their content moderation um, uh, mechanisms are faulty, and there is no transparency whatsoever about this. So this comes. This means that um, an effect of having automated systems monitor everything we upload on the internet means that our rights are severely impacted. So upload filters um, and the existing content filters will replace notice and takedown mechanisms that are actually based on the law and that offers people protection um, by a process in which content is taken down based on terms of service and based on community standards. So this means that your uh, rights to freedom of expression are severely undermined. You have no right to redress, as we saw in these two examples. Um, and this also poses threats to your data protection and privacy. Uh, I missed that. Yeah, so this is, this is basically what the rule of law looks like if it's up to YouTube. So um, this is a, an a advocate who works for ACLU uh, who is calling uh, YouTube out publicly on Twitter about the um, uh, Women on Waves accounts. So what we see is that the EU institutions are not only allowing but championing the creation of an intricate surveillance system by internet companies who have comp again and again disregarded our privacy, disregarded our freedom of expression, and disregarded our democracies in favor of their bottom line. And we see as inevitable a situation in which there is an upload filter for possible copyright infringement, for possible terrorist content, for possible sexual explicit content, for possible hate speech, um, creating a digital information ecosystem in which everything we say or even everything we try to say um, is monitored. And in the best case scenario, um, it is Facebook or Google who allows us to speak. Thank you. Uh, for the next uh, half an hour, we will have a panel discussion over here, and uh, of which uh, 50 minutes for just some extra questions, and then I hope you have some questions, and I will come to you with the microphone. So, would you please, all the uh, speakers, would you please sit over here, and uh, Sarah, would you please sit over there? So, please come up. Yes, thank you. Okay. And you see a new face, um, Sarah St. Vincent. She is with Human Rights Watch, researcher and advocate on national security and domestic law informants for the U.S. program at Human Rights Watch. So, um, you know, since it's about Human Rights uh, Watch and human rights, um, I asked you uh, before uh, uh, the program, you know, to um, listen to the speakers, maybe make some notes, and I just wonder, you know, what's your take on what these people said, you know? Any remarkable stuff, interesting stuff, stuff that made you happy, or made you concerned, or <laughs> sad? So please, elaborate. Well, I, I work on US surveillance, so my uh, emotions are always a little bit on the uh, sad or disturbed side. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'm Sarah St. Vincent. I am a researcher and advocate on US surveillance issues, <clears throat> excuse me, at Human Rights Watch. Got a bit of a cold, um, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, but yes, I had uh, many thoughts about these presentations, all of which I, I felt were excellent, and I congratulate my co-panelists. Um, when watching Ben, I thought, you know, I, it's, it's magical what you can do with open source information. But if, as someone who really looks at what governments can do, it only highlights for me the strong safeguards because these that kind of research looks one way when we're thinking about a citizen journalist 
uh, doing this to, you know, to prove the authenticity of a video, it looks another way when we think about the ways that governments can use this to achieve repressive goals. So my colleagues in our China program, for example, are looking into the way the Chinese government opposes the Uyghur Muslim minority in Xinjiang province in the northwest of China. And so you know, when we think about the difference between Ben and a government, of course, is that the government can execute you, it can put you in prison, it can send a drone strike down from the sky. It has a monopoly on the use of, of force and imprisonment. And so I think that you know, sometimes people say when we talk about surveillance, you know, well, I could find this online. Why shouldn't the government be able to get it? Why shouldn't police be able to get it? And the answer is that what, I mean, the government can do things to us that, you know, really have an incredible impact on our lives or can even end them or result in us being in prison for years or decades. And so I think this highlights for me the need for a very strong limits on what the government can do and the purposes for which it can do it. Um, so for example, when we think about the issue of, of content takedowns, governments will often point to the, the justifications they think, or really for any kind of surveillance, they'll point to the justifications that they think their, their base, their, their voting base, will find most compelling. And so they'll point to terrorism and so on. Um, but what you don't see is that they can then use this for just about anything. And in the US, we face the struggle where the government will say, oh, terrorism, terrorism. And don't get me wrong, that's obviously a, a terrible, serious threat. But we need to look at also, what are they not saying that they use it for? So for example, white supremacy or materials that are really misogynist. You know, what, how are they selling this to us? And then what kinds of safeguards are in place, both in law and in policy, to prevent serious misuses of this? Because as we can see from all these presentations, this is incredibly powerful. And I think the points about free expression that, that several of, of us have raised, you know, it's not only freedom of expression, it's freedom of assembly, freedom of religion. You know, are you going to go to your house of worship if you know the government can tell that you've been there? Are you going to go to that protest if there's a record that you, you know, you took the tram there? You know, are there cell phone location records showing where you've been and who you've been with? So I think we always need to think about these impacts on our rights. <clears throat> and the human rights framework for addressing this is to ensure that measures are lawful, necessary, and proportionate. Lawful meaning there ought to be laws. So yes, law often races to catch up with technology. In the US, we're often dealing with surveillance laws that date to the 1980s, um, which obviously is, as I feel acutely myself, is a long time ago, <laughs> um, as someone who was born in the 80s. Uh, but so there ought to be laws, there ought to be a framework, and there ought to be consequences and accountability when police or intelligence agencies or whomever overstep those bounds. And so one struggle we have in the US, for example, is Yes, you can sue, um, but for example, if you're a defendant in a criminal case, the government might just refuse to tell you what was done. Or in a lawsuit, there might be various things the government or a company can do to avoid disclosing these things. So there need to be really strong legal protections and boundaries, what is allowed, what is not allowed. Sarah, yeah. when government refuses to do that kind of stuff, is that lawful? Are, you, are they doing that based on the law? So in the United States, I think the government thinks it's lawful for them not to tell you. But we actually, we have a report that came out uh, about a year ago called Dark Side, which yeah. is about the US government. We, we think through our research, deliberately withholding evidence from defendants that the government doesn't want to reveal. It won't, basically they'll find some other explanation for how an investigation started so that a judge never looks at or thinks about, for example, surveillance or social media monitoring, things like that. I just wanna briefly run through the other two prongs. Necessary, what the government does ought to be necessary to achieving a legitimate goal. And if there's some other less intrusive, less free expression impacting way of doing it, then it's not strictly necessary. The European Court of Human Rights standard is strictly necessary in a democratic society. So again, there ought to be boundaries and the justifications have to be good enough. And then lastly, proportionate. We could stick a camera in every single house, in every single room, in every single house, and prevent a lot of crime that way. But again, that's a disproportionate impact on your rights. People will be chilled from doing many things that they could legitimately do. It'll be very restrained. And again, in a free society, that's not what you want. Surveillance and artificial intelligence are extremely powerful tools, and again, there need to be limits. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for this uh, part. Just one question for you. Do you, you 
or your colleagues, do you use any uh, big data or artificial, artificial intelligence in your own line of job? So my relationship with, with it, it depends how we define AI or, or big data. I it's actually a have yes. a project that... It's a yes, I can feel it. No, actually, so I don't, <laughs> I mean, in the sense that do I sometimes use Google? Yes. Yes. Um, but again, you know, are, are we talking about, well, Google is also machine learning, but so yes, in, in that sense. Um, but right now, for example, I have an investigation into how police use big data that's sold by data brokers in the US, where we don't have a general data protection regulation. We have only weak personal data protection laws, meaning that police can simply buy access to an enormous range and, and, and range of, of personal data about you, including some very sensitive things and have allegedly misused that. So I'm sure some of my, my colleagues who really, who for example do more kind of satellite based research may maybe use some of these tools, but for myself I'm often more thinking about what are, how could the government be misusing them? And I also have to say as someone who's doing a very journalistic type activity, I think a lot about the fact that it's, these tools can make it very hard for me to do my job. It's hard for me to get a tip from a source or pursue a tip from a source or pursue a sense of investigation without leaving a digital trail. These yeah. companies, as has been pointed out, you know, create, gather enormous amounts of data about what we do, where we've gone and so on. And that makes the journalistic aspect of free expression very hard. Okay, I understand. Just a couple of questions for you and then I will give uh, audience the floor to ask some questions. Um, question for maybe you both. When uh, Benjamin, when he, uh, he did a great presentation, but at the same time we could see all the faces, all those people, on, you know, here and maybe everywhere, you know. What were your thoughts uh, when you uh, saw that? Fun. It's something like, Benjamin, it's, uh, you are using or abusing the big data in a way? Um, well, I think a really important I have no idea where this is supposed to be. Just move this Okay. <laughs> um, I think a really important point was raised. Uh, so it depends uh, for a big part on um, who is using uh, these sources. And um, I think when you look at, um, uh, and, and, and then so you're looking at sort of citizen versus citizen in um, Ben's case. Um, and I think different, um, uh, we would all say that the, what is uh, okay to do or what isn't is very different than when you look at the relationship between citizens and, and governments. And I think especially in the places where that uh, sort of relationship is already um, tilted to one side a lot. Uh, so when there's an unequal power balance, I think all these questions become a lot more interesting. Um, I had, I don't know. I didn't have any problem with the with what we were seeing um, in Ben's presentation. I think it was uh, great that you uh, blocked out the names of the yeah so far yeah uh, some names yeah, yeah but the other name we saw uh, just the whole name we saw and, and especially the, the the faces we saw. But the same question for you. What was your uh, if I ask you yeah. about that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah just hold, ah, just hold. all right. Um, well, for me, the first thing was, um, why, why do people put this online? Uh, no, I, 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 it's a sick question, because if you do something that is uh, unlawful or forbidden or uh, not within the, the, the regions of the instructions you get from the commander, why, why, why is it filmed and put online? Yeah. That was one. Governmental uh, organizations normally say if you put something online yourself, like on Facebook, like on Twitter, yeah. you have made it public. Uh, that's why we can use it. So if, if I would look at it from that perspective, they would say, oh, well, it's not a problem. It's not uh, a problem. That's how we, how we are treated. Yeah, so let's uh, ask the man himself. You, I can imagine, but correct me if I'm wrong, that, that showing pictures, faces, names, is kind of um, a subject, an issue with you, among you and your colleagues, is this something you talk about? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, but I mean, if if I if I blocked out the faces, yeah. the fact that they're on Facebook in the first place allows pretty much every person in this room room that already has a phone and a mobile phone internet connection to look them up. Yeah. You know, it's it's and that's what open source is, right? It's not closed source. It's not an intelligence report or anything like that. This is 
each and every one of you can find these people, can map out the Cameroon military, can find their bases through open source evidence. So I say, why not show it? Because it's already out there. You're just sort of joining the dots like a child for an elephant picture. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Can I okay. ask a, a question? Sure. So do you think that um, law enforcement should also have no restrictions on using open source data? Uh, law enforcement don't have restrictions whatsoever. But do you think they should? Um, I think they should, but it's the fact that they keep it within themselves is quite different. They're not able to publish things like I do. Mm -hmm. They're not able to tell people like what I do because they have access to closed source. So mm -hmm. nothing they do, they, they all, they, even if they did a 99% paper on open source and Facebook, that 1% of closed source piece puts that big fat confidential stamp over the front. Mm -hmm. maybe, uh, Evelyn, maybe you can ask the same question to them. Mm -hmm. Please, what's your take on this question? Um, well, I just want to comment on the fact that, y yes, governments have, although they can and do rely on open source data, I do think it's all too easy for them to then sort of, at least in the United States, say, well, this is classified or this is law enforcement sensitive, which is this weird category that's not actually classified. They're just trying to get you not to disclose it. And the problem is that then if that's not going into court or it's not reaching the public, you have no way of challenging it. You have no way of knowing what they're doing. And legislators also will not have a way really of knowing how police and intelligence agencies are interpreting the laws and thinking about should the laws be changed, should they be strengthened, what do we want to allow or not allow, judges don't get to say, does this comply with fundamental rights? And so I think that the, unfortunately the fact that law enforcement agencies are not always disclosing their sources, open source or not, is really a problem because it means we don't reach these, these big questions that we're all here to consider today. And um, Frau Van Eyck, uh, what's your take on it? Well, I, 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 <laughs> um, I wanted to ask if, if you know why they put it online. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, are, are, you, are you dodging my question? <laughs> a bit? A yeah, bit? Yes. Yes. That's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. Okay, you yeah. ask a question. Benjamin, what's your answer? Yeah, uh, I think we're going into the psychology of a young man with a gun that has a big ego trip. <laughs> If, you're, if you want me to answer properly. Um, but considering the fact that I work with this sort of stuff every day, they term it in, in namely Africa and other, other places called glory videos. It's something that you can look back on in your past and think, I had a great time. I did that. I feel powerful. Oh, okay. And it's that person behind a weapon that has that power, that control of power. That's, that's why they have that video of proof to remind themselves, here's a memento of the power that I had. That's why they put it online. Okay. And they share it amongst their friends to, hey, look at me. And Melissa, are you going to answer my question now? Or, okay, I can, no. I get it. No, 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 it's your party, it's your party, you're my guest. Okay, now it's time for you to ask some questions. Uh, I have much more questions and subjects to ask, but as I said, it's your time. So please stand up and um, maybe I don't have to tell you what the question is, you know, this sentence with the question mark, you know, especially with the question mark. So please. Nobody? Yes, over there, yes. Yeah. Please stand up. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, hello. Um, I have a question for um, Sarah, for instance. And it's, um, you're talking about um, how to uh, keep uh, the people safe uh, uh, for the government. So the government is the ones uh, we have to um, brace ourselves for. But what about uh, all the other uh, companies that are not uh, validated through a democratic process and uh, also have um, the power to uh, decide whether you can live somewhere you want or um, mm. uh, get an uh, insurance or and so forth and so forth. Great, you made your point there, please. Yeah, thank you. And this is where I don't want to sit here and behave as if governments only abuse technology and I think in, in a a kind of multi-institutional system, you have different parts, of course, playing different roles. And I think part of the problem here is, is a lack of law, because you're right. There are companies that sell, quote unquote, AI solutions to do things that wind up in, in reality, as research has suggested, disproportionately impact, impacting the poor, disproportionately impacting or punishing people of color, the homeless. And so I think there's currently, at least in the United States, a real failure on the part of lawmakers to see what's happening and then create laws to address this and to regulate those companies. Um, in the EU, from what I understand of the general data protection regulation and the things that preceded it, as flawed as that may be, it does set some rules. And in the US where we're operating in this environment where companies are basically allowed to gather 
almost all kinds of personal data with some exceptions, and then mine that or apply predictive technologies to it as they see fit. And then, as I said, sell this and make a profit. And again, I think that what we need, at least in the United States, is the government and legislatures to step in and say, here's where the lines are, here's what is or isn't permitted, while taking you know, a, a context-sensitive perspective, mm -hmm. which I think all of us up here are trying to do, and say, you know, what are the clear dangers here? You know, what are the issues with someone not being able to get a loan because some algorithm has decided they're not trustworthy? What factors is it relying on? Because that can really impact that person's life. Or what about um, my colleague John Rafling has done research on bail algorithms in California, such that instead of people having to use cash to get out of jail, which obviously punishes the poor, you know, there's a movement toward algorithms, but algorithms often incorporate some of those same potentially discriminatory factors that the old system did. And so we really need to, I think, have legislatures do what they're supposed to do and take a look at what should or shouldn't be allowed to have a just society and, and regulate those companies. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, here and there. Okay. Uh, Hi, sorry. I also have a question for Sarah. I was, it, it kind of rang an alarm bell. You're talking about that digital trail and the journalistic work that you do. And I want to come back to how Human Rights Watch works and always, of course, makes great effort to protect not only the researchers, but especially the victims, the witnesses, uh, to all kinds of various uh, human rights uh, atrocities and, and breaches. How does this digital trail and tracking require Human Rights Watch to take new kinds of, or in, instill new kinds of protections, new kinds of systems to protect those same people that obviously are not gonna be as protected with you know, Big Brother watching and digital trails? Sure, I can only answer from the perspective of, of my own research. I, I think various of my colleagues have things that they do in their context. So I'm sure if, for example, you're working in China, the picture maybe looks different. Um, so for me, it, it's thinking about when do I use Tor to do an anonymous search and not reveal automatically to someone that I'm looking for something? When, you know, when I'm trying to verify that a source is who they say they are, how do I gather information about them without, again, creating a record that I've searched that person's name? Um, is the source willing to use Signal, you know, an, an encrypted technology, encrypted chat and, and um, phone call technology? Some sources are willing to do that. It can still leave a record that we've communicated, but not the content of the conversation. Other sources worry about using encryption because they think it draws a bullseye on them and says to the government, here's something really interesting that someday we want to crack into. And so I, I think that we all get some basic training on digital security and thinking about source protection, but then it's something that we all wind up working out within our teams and with our information security director and, and so on. For whatever specific research project we're doing, what's the best way to keep our sources and ourselves safe? So there's no single answer to that question, but I can tell you, I think it's something that we're all thinking about all the time. Yeah. And, and how about you, Malisha? Would you like Yeah, I, I, I wanted to, to, to advertise a bit for the Dutch initiative, the startpage.com, which is a research machine. It works really well if you're used to Google and you can use Startpage. It generates um, marvelous results without following you or building up uh, information on you. Okay, cool. I saw a hand over there, and here the each was first. Please stand. Oh. Hi, I have a, one question and one opinion. So question first, <laughs> uh, maybe to more to Benjamin. Um, the years ago, before I moved to Amsterdam, I worked in a suicide prevention center. And for a long time, we're working there. We want to, we're actually working together with Facebook in Hong Kong. We want to generate an alarm system to analyze based on the user's dialogue and poster online. We want to, um, uh, set alarm that when somebody uh, are trying to commit suicide or trying to do something uh, online or go live because nowadays seems like people like to go live when they are committing suicide behavior which have a strong uh, negative impact on the audience who received image and who watch watch this so I want to know my the question is uh, we have a lot of trouble when we are want to generate this idea, because people on the other side think we're monitoring their behavior. And, but on the other side, as a sociology, we want to do the intervention, and we want to stop suicide behavior, no matter what we can do. So how we can choose our position in this. And sorry, what? Well, first question for, for, for the yeah. answer, for the, yes, Benjamin, you were addressed, yeah. 
Um, so I think your question is essentially asking me how can you create a bot, an artificial intelligence bot, to like a suicide awareness bot for Facebook? Is that right? Is it right? Uh, we're actually wait, 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 please. So it's very important to ask the question you know, yeah. specific as possible. Um, we believe we should do this, yeah. but a lot of people think it's unnecessary to even do so. Yeah. Yes, yeah. basically. Uh, look. Um, if you're asking if I agree with you or not, I do completely agree with you because there are some niche, I mean, Facebook is, everyone has Facebook and if you don't, then people say, why don't you have Facebook, right? Um, and, and, and I think Facebook is almost becoming that moral fabric of a community, even in Africa, you know, uh, uh, or, or remote places around the world. There's so much to do with Facebook. It's, you know, there's events on there, there's communities built around it, there's, there's government pages that you can like and see interactive events on and all that sort of stuff. But I think uh, for niche communities, Facebook is trying to reach out towards. Uh, for instance, there is now an AI bot that crawls every single photo, analyzes the photo and puts words in it so that people who are blind can use Facebook and you can have an audible recount of what that photo is. So you can scroll through your newsfeed as a blind person and use Facebook because it caters for that niche demographic. So I do agree with you. I think that Facebook should, can, should uh, uh, create something in that respect to cater for that niche. It's, a, it's an important group and, and, and I'm sure that you know, there's something that could work with that, yeah. And uh, Sarah, what's your take on it? Yeah, sorry, I just want, well, I want to put in a, a plug for Human Rights Watch film screening in London on March 13th, which is called The Cleaners. And it's about how Many of us, I think, assume that it is bots going through and, and doing takedowns, but there are actually thousands of human mm. beings who are paid, perhaps not very well, to look at very disturbing content related to yeah. self-harm, related to harm of others, of various things. And this is what they do all day, and this is what the system relies on in part as humans saying, right. accept, remove, accept, <laughs> remove. Yeah. And so not only the free speech impact of that, but also then there are humans behind this potentially being harmed by the desire to moderate, although again, it's not that moderation is, is not something that should be done. I want to come back to that framing I said before of lawful, necessary, and proportionate, is that it, shouldn't it really perhaps be for governments to decide you know, what, what the rules are around companies monitoring our content and choosing whether to remove it, and why is it that legislatures seem to be abdicating their role so often? Okay. Um, Evelyn, would you please... Uh... Yeah, I, I would just like to add to that... Oh, there you are. Um, that Probably your, your intentions are wonderful. You want to uh, prevent um, suicide. You want to help people who have suicidal thoughts. Um, but then you're talking about um, asking the biggest surveillance company in the world to gather very detailed information about people's mental health. But it's all publicly available posts. That I really do not agree with you on. Is Sarah? <laughs> so this, this public-private distinction, at least, again, I'm going to speak from a US law perspective briefly. Yeah. You know, There used to be this thought that if, if it was public, whatever we think that means, then it was fair game for the government. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing, at least in US courts, is a realization that in, in the digital age, that distinction no longer makes sense. And the European Court of Human Rights, at least, has recognized that. It, the court has said there is a zone of interaction with others that falls within the sphere of your private life, even if it takes place in public. And so that's things like your personal and professional relationships, your gender identity, various other things that even if it seems public doesn't mean that your human rights no longer apply. And similarly in the US with things like location tracking, we have the Supreme Court saying, look, it's not about whether it's, it's necessarily public or private. We need to think about the actual sensitivity of this data and what it can reveal about your personal life. Okay. Yeah. May I ask you, but you, both of you, yeah, about this, this uh, boundary between public and private, whether it's still working in, in, in praxis? Well, I was going to say, I think this is one of the um, biggest challenges uh, that AI is going to throw at us, or maybe already is. So we, we do share um, a lot of data with these platforms, and we do so for reasons that are different to every one of us. And I think what AI is um, bringing us is it's taking lots of information that isn't necessarily <laughs> sensitive, that isn't necessarily very, very personal, and it's inferring very, very sensitive information from it. So what if it's true that um, going live on Facebook means that you have a serious mental health problem? Um, that information is not protected under, um, um, doesn't have the same protections as um, s sort of straight up mental health information would have. So I, th I, I think that's something we have to be aware of. Yeah. And then the, the, the so um, 
going back to what Benjamin was saying, um, if it's if it's true that what we place on on Twitter, for example, is public, so we don't care who sees it or in what context. Um, how would you feel about every message that you send to Twitter first sending it to the police and then getting them to upload it? I think that would feel very, very oppressive to all of us, and that is basically what law enforcement is doing. Yeah, is that right, Benjamin? Yeah. You wouldn't like to every message first sending to the police before <laughs> uploading? I think if I made a tweet, yeah, sure. I mean, every single person on the planet can read it, right? So yeah. if you really don't want something found out about yourself, do some education and learn not to put it out there. Okay. Maybe final word for Sarah and then a question over there. Yes, Sarah. So I want to make a distinction first, which is that Ben is not the government. And so it, it's not, when we say that things are public, I'm not saying that people like, like us shouldn't be able to see what's out there. I mean, the right to receive information is part of the right to free expression. And so you're exercising your journalistic freedoms. However, um, I think that when we say, well, people know it's public and they put it out there, there's, there's a potential there to slide into victim blaming. So for example, in the United States, once I've tweeted something, whatever Twitter has gathered or inferred about me, including my location, if they're inferring something about my mood, you know, and so on, I can never get them to delete that data, to correct it if it's wrong, to even show me what data they have. In the EU, you now have some rights about that. We don't. And so to say to people, it's your fault, you made it public, one, we often didn't. Did we know we were making our location data you know, available to Twitter through these things? Did we know there might be an inference about our mood and who interacts with that post? No, we don't necessarily realize what they're getting. And secondly, we then are left with no way to take it back and we're treated as if we consented to everything when really I think our understanding of what we consented to is much narrower. So, okay, I understand. But in a way, Ben, I guess you are glad that they don't have that law <laughs> in Cameroon to retrieve the information and delete it. Uh, the, you mean the Cameroon government? Yeah. You are glad that they, well, yeah. they don't have that, that, that law so they can use it. I am glad. And then that's, yeah. uh, if I might just make a quick comment, it's, uh, I think it works in both favors of, uh, of, of both personal freedom but also government freedom. And if you hop on Strava, you can map out US military bases and then you can have a look at the running profiles and find them on Facebook as well and see a selfie of a US Marine at the, uh, at the silo factory between Aleppo in, in, in Syria. So yeah. it works on both ways in the yeah. fact that I think the government needs to wisen up about what's online too. Cool. Um, your question, please, yeah. I'll give it back, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> it's morphed by now, my question, because of the discussion, but it has something to do with to what extent are we personally, personally also responsible. And I do understand that there's very much a privileged element in that, because everybody sitting here is living probably in Holland and higher educated. But how would you look at that and what can we do to make everybody more responsible? Sounds like a great, uh, thank you very much for the question. You know, one of the questions, I would like to wrap up the discussion. So for four of you, that's the question. You know, so we start with, no, we end up with you because it's your festival. We start here, <laughs> yeah, Human Rights Watch Festival, yes. A uh, festival, I mean, weekend. So let's start here. Could you repeat the question? Yes, very good. Repeat the question, please. Repeat the question, yeah, it's your question. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, it's, a, it's about to what extent are you personally responsible? Uh, and uh, we are privileged here, so that we're not representative for the whole world, mm -hmm. but what can we do about that? Okay. <laughs> so I, I think um, a certain amount of, of tech savviness uh, might be asked of all of us, uh, if not now, then in the future. Um, but I also think it's very important that we don't uh, organize society uh, depend or sort of based on our assumption that everyone will uh, know everything about the services um, and, and they use and the internet. Um, so I think that's why we really need strong laws to protect the people who um, can't protect themselves, who aren't interested in protecting themselves. Um, it's about personal freedom, that's true, and about personal rights. Um, but when I post uh, something to Facebook or Twitter, and, and sure, maybe I do indeed uh, make the, my own decision to share that information, I'm also giving information about other people. So there's a lot of 
information you can infer based on what I uploaded um, that I really have no clue about. And you can't expect people um, to, uh, to uh, have that knowledge. Um, so strong laws, um, okay. that's what we need. Elise, what's your take? Um, yes, I think it's really important that we understand that it will divide us uh, in a way because AI is about excluding and including. So it will, do, okay, this group uh, gets the red lane, so it is surveyed, and this group gets the green lane and uh, gets to move on. So it's really important we understand it. People need to understand better that uh, behind the process of uh, how, how an, a decision hits you or comes to you. It's a bot, per, for instance, so that makes you react in a different way. And, uh, well, Virginia Eubanks has d done some survey in the United States how automation um, enhances in inequalities in a very, very, very um, uh, m many ways we, we would never ex uh, think of in, the, in advance. And that's something we see in the Netherlands as well. So it, it, hits, it hits the people that are poor more than the rich people, because the poor people are in the databases and they are surveyed, but not the, the, the rich guys and the bankers there, so who, who commit fraud as well. They are not in the databases. So we have to be aware of this um, division of the, of the population. Yeah. Benjamin. Final yeah. word for you. Uh, cool. So, yeah, some awesome points. Uh, I've got two points. So, first of all, um, and no offence, but I, I think uh, I, I think laws for for the the groups that you sign up for, like Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram, should be written in English. Um, so maybe just a little bit of you know dot points of this is what's going to happen when you give me your data. This 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 and this. So that people don't have to read whole heaps of legal text, but can actually read something simple. Because I don't read it, and I know the owner of Twitter doesn't even read his own privacy rules. He just said an interview last week. So Jack's out for that. Second point is that we should become more critical thinkers about the information that we we consume. If you type into YouTube and you're a young kid researching Germany and Hitler, and you start to research, and then, and then the YouTube algorithm kicks in and starts feeding you fascist content, before you know it, you're only getting YouTube recommendations of fascist content. And then you can go to the algorithm bot on Facebook and you start liking those pages and becoming friends with people who align with fascist content. And before you know, you've got a 30-year-old fascist on your hands. I think people need to be more critical thinking about what happens right there. That's dangerous and that's AI. My, my, well spoken. I know, well, okay. parents, but I think uh, uh, the most important thing is for those companies to say, okay, We've, we're we're catering, for, catering for the user by making the user experience more friendly by giving IAC soccer videos or videos of cats on, on, on this, but they need to be aware that they could be raising young potential jihadists or young potential extremists, and that's, that's what needs to stop right there. That's I think dangerous. we have to create laws that prevent businesses from screwing us over. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sarah, Actually, what's your... Actually, let me, let me briefly pick up on that point, but I do want to turn back to focus on what you can do, which is to say, yes, we can have kind of the, the greatest, clearest terms in the world, and I think we should, but if a company is a de facto monopoly, which I'm not saying any of them are, um, that's above my pay grade, <laughs> but if a company is a monopoly, then the clearest terms in the world explaining exactly what kind of data they're going to collect and, and mine forever, you know, if you don't really have a meaningful choice but to use that platform in order to be connected in today's world, then, you know, I, I think that that's, again, there's a role for the legislature there to look at whether this is a monopoly, and if so, what can be done? Um, so in terms of what you can do, I, I would like to come back to points that others have said, which is self-education. Virginia Eubanks' book, uh, Automating Inequality, is a wonderful read. It does talk about the consequences of algorithms uh, for the poor and people of color in the United States, but I think it can be thought-provoking for all of us, no matter what our context. Same with um, Kathy O'Neill, has a book called Weapons of Math Destruction, yeah. Math, M-A-T-H. Yes. Um, and again, I think just just being able to think about these things from a from a perspective that's sensitive to history, that's sensitive to what minorities are oppressed in, in your country or your context and why. In the United States, I think whenever we talk about algorithms or surveillance, we always have to think about the ways the African or American community and other communities of color have always been excessively monitored and punished based on what has been found. Um, and so I would say that, that responsibility to educate ourselves and then think about what you can do to be an activist in your own way. Can you write a letter to the editor of the newspaper? Can you contact your elected representatives if you think that's appropriate? Um, you know, what are, I, I think that people think it doesn't make a difference. I think that the small things do make a difference. You know, this is not a very original expression, but walls are made of bricks. You need that piece by piece by piece, and those pieces do add up to something. So please don't walk out of here feeling powerless 
if, if this discussion has really got you fired up, then by all means, go out and talk about it. You know, bring it up with your friends, your family members, and, and try to be an active participant in these debates in whatever way you can. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. Thank you. Great. So that's it uh, for now, folks. So thank you very much, the Human Rights Watch and the Bali for organizing this uh, weekend. And uh, of course, our technician, Ronald, thank you so much with your team for your work. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, moderator. Okay. Okay.